Hi, this is Greg from Structure Toolkit, and in this video, we're going to go through how to use the Peered Beam Design Module. The Peered Beam Design Module can be found under the Footings section of the desktop. Using the module, you can design suspended concrete beams for footing systems such as a concrete rough slab or strip footing in accordance with AS3600. The piers the beams are supported on can be designed as circular or rectangular piers or set as screw piles. For the design of a suspended slab that would often form part of a peered beam footing system, we would need to use the two-way slab and concrete member design modules, but we will go into this in another video. For the example in this video, we will design an edge beam of a suspended residential concrete rough slab that needs to be founded down to 1500 mm due to tree effects. We'll have the site be classified as class H1 and at a fountain depth of 1500 millimeters, we'll have a bearing capacity of 250 kPa. As for the loads on the beam, we'll have a 2.7 meter external stud wall above with 1.4 meter load width of sheet roof. As for the floor load, we'll have a 1.25 meters load width that comprises of a 130 millimeter thick suspended slab with standard floor coverings. So to get started, we'll open up a peered beam module. The first part of our design will be the geometry of our footing system. For our beam, we'll take the deemed to comply clad framed H1 raft slab using a typical 25 MPA with it being 400 deep and 300 wide. The reason we're using this proportioning is because if the trees causing drying effects under the slab were to be removed, the soil will rehydrate and then our footing system would return back to a non-suspended slab. If piers were being used due to fill on the site, then you may not need to consider the site's classification when working out your beam sizes and reinforcement. Next, our slab thickness will be 130, as we discussed earlier, and we'll be designing an edge beam, so we'll leave it as E. For this module, edge beams are taken as L beams, and internal are taken as T-beams. This will affect the effective width of our member. For our beam reinforcement, we'll take the 3L11 trench mesh for the bottom that is specified in AS2870. And so we'll put in 270 millimeters squared here. For a quick reference on what each kind of reinforcement might be in millimeters squared, we can have a look at this table down in the bottom right here. As the beam is suspended, we'll also have to apply some top reinforcement to deal with the negative bending. So we'll also put 270 millimeters squared in the top reinforcement. Our normal bar size will be 10.7. For our slab reinforcement, we'll assume we've completed a design with SL82 mesh that works fine, and so leave it as 227 millimeters squared per meter. In reality, you would need to check this as a natural design, but it will be something we'll look at in another video. For our piers, we'll leave it as a circular and 450 millimeter diameter. And for our centers, we'll put in a tentative two meters. We might need to optimize this a bit later. For the depth below our ridge beam, we know that we need to fan down to 1500. So assuming the floor level is 150 above ground level and taking off the depth of the edge beam being 400, We'll put in here 12 to 50. We'll leave our peer density as 24 kilonewtons per meters cubed for this example, but it is useful to note that you may be able to reduce this in certain situations to account for the removal of soil to install the peer. For our bearing pressure, we'll put in our 250 kPa. For this example, we'll leave skin friction as zero, as we're only going down to 1500 depth. This option does need to be used with care, as it is commonly advised that skin friction can only be considered below the depth of designed soil suction change, being HS, which depending on the site can be anywhere from 1.5 meters to even deeper than four meters. You'll need to refer to your geotechnical engineer and AS2870 for advice on this. The next part of this design is now our loadings. At the start of the video, we went through what our different load widths were, so we can just plug them all in here. For our roof dead load, we'll have 1400 of sheet roof. So that will be 0.4 kPa at 1400. For our floor load, we'll have 0.5 kPa, which will represent some standard floor coverings over our slab. And have this at 
1250. There are a few ways you could arrive at a load width for your floor and slab load and it really depends on the geometry of your slab and whether it acts in two-way or one-way bending. Our 1250 could be either half the span of a one-way slab or an approximation of a triangulated load for two-way bending. Next our uh, wall dead load will be 0.5 at 2700 and finally we'll need to put in our slabs weight. In our case we can rename the cell over here to slab dead load which will then appear on the left. To then determine what our slab's weight will be in KPA, we can use the cell itself to calculate it for us. We can do this by going the thickness multiplied by 25 kilonewtons meters cubed, which will give us 3.25 KPA. We'll then put in the load width of 1250, being the same as our floor dead load. We can then apply the same process to our roof live load. We'll have our 0.25 KPA at 1400, and we'll have our 1.5 kPa for floor live load at 12.50. These loads will then calculate out to produce an ultimate UDL, which takes us to our next section being our design forces. These design forces are calculated based on standard beam formulas for both two and three spans. It also takes into account pattern loading, which ensures critical forces under different load scenarios are encapsulated. For example, the maximum sagging moment of a two-span beam with a UDL is actually greater when only one of the spans has a UDL on it, as opposed to being over both spans. With the design forces calculated, we can now look at the design capacities. For strength in bending, the ASD min is checked for both positive and negative bending, taking into account the extra provisions for T and L sections. A standard concrete bending capacity is then calculated for both positive and negative bending cases. The shear strength of the beam is then calculated based on just the concrete contribution. If you want to include leaks in the design, then you would need to use the concrete member design module. In our example, we won't do this and we'll rely just on the concrete contribution. The shear design consists of both a simplified and general method from AS3600, which we can switch between here. Next is the pier capacity, where we get a few extra options that affect the applied reaction on the pier. The first is the continuity factor, where we can pick which span case we want to look at, which will affect the distribution of the reactions on critical piers. For our example, we'll leave it as the three spans, which will give us a continuity factor of 1.1. The next option we have is to reduce the live load forces on the pier by 50% which is a provision that comes from AS2870 and so should only be applied for residential buildings. We'll see if we can get the design to work without it for now and so we'll leave it off. Do note this option only affects the live load on the pier. This section will then give us a pier reaction which includes its self weight. We'll also get a pier capacity which is calculated based on our bearing capacity and skin friction. Finally, we have the serviceability check of our peered beam design, which uses the deemed to conform method from AS3600, which checks the ratio of the effective span to effective depth. As we are dealing with a standard residential distributed loan scenario, we can leave the psi factors as they are. We can also leave the deflection limit as it is as well, which comes from table 2.3.2. Something to be aware of with this method, however, is that it could only be used for when the live load does not exceed the dead load. If this were the case, we would have a warning up here. If we now scroll up to the top, we can see a summary of all these checks we've done, which in our case are all within capacity. What we could do now is optimize the design a bit if required, such as increasing the pier spacing. For our case, we'll just leave them as they are. In a real design, what we would want to do now is check our internal beams and also any other potentially critical edge beams in our slab system. The process for these would then be the same as in this video. That about covers all you need to know for completing a peered beam design in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.